All right. All right, so let's just see how we're doing. We've got some people coming in, so we'll just give you just a moment if you could let us know where you are located, and uh, we'll just get started in just a little bit. All right, so it looks like looks like people are still filing in, but I will go ahead and end that poll. So thank you for, for sharing. Uh, it looks like once again, we have uh, participants from right across uh, right across Canada. And also it looks like we have quite a few from the territories. So that's excellent. Uh, thank you very much. I will also po uh, post one more poll, we'd like to know your occupation. So let us know what, uh, what occupation uh, this uh, th you are in. Uh, if, it, if you don't see yours listed, then just let us know in the chat. Oh, very nice. It looks like we've got representation from right across uh, the different uh, occupations listed. All right, so I'll just share that. So thank you very much. So it looks like uh, we have builders and developers, our renovators, some architects, and uh, some of the other um, some of the other occupations. Excellent. So I'm just going to stop sharing my screen. And uh, oh, I see. So new home warranty. Excellent. So welcome everybody. My name is Stephanie Coleman with Building Knowledge, and I'm very excited today um, for for the four part series, which is a carbon uh, emission series that is uh, sponsored by Enbridge. So before I hand uh, things over to Susan for a moment. Just did want to do a little bit of uh, housekeeping. So as we uh, normally do with these uh, Zoom webinars, I would ask that if you have any questions, so I'm going to be doing the presentation today, and then we'll later be joined by Jeff Salazar from Enbridge. Um, but if you do have any questions, use the Q&A function. Um, and then what I'll do is uh, is I'll uh, pull those questions out as we uh, as we go through. Um, and But if you do have any sort of um, just general comments or any sort of issues like that, just let, just let us know in the chat. Use that for just general communications, not so much uh, questions for for the uh, for the presenters, which uh, today will be me and Jeff. So once again, thank you. Now, of course, uh, we can't do these things uh, on our own, and uh, we are very excited to uh, have Enbridge uh, uh, sponsor this event in this four part series. So, Susan, I would like to invite you to say a few words. Oh, thanks, Stephanie. Um... So I guess on behalf of Enbridge Gas and you know, most specifically our residential new construction team that, that I work with, you know, we wanna welcome everybody participating today. We think that today is the start of a really fascinating four part series. And it's one that sort of continues to show how our builders and researchers are leading the discussion and the advancement of energy transition thinking in the province. And these four sessions will, again, along with our other webinar series, will take the steps to educate and, and sort of provide some new and really impactful ways that the construction industry can impact climate change by looking at all aspects of greenhouse gases, including both operational and the uh, manufactured material carbon intensity. You know, the energy transition is not happening to Ontario builders. It is being led by Ontario builders. And, you know, we look forward at Enbridge to working right along with you as we move into providing some of the more new and exciting forms of alternative energy solutions. And some of those you'll hear about later today. And, you know, as you know, our tagline is that life takes energy. 
And our goal is continuing to improve the lives of all Ontarians by continuing to be your energy provider of choice, regardless of what that choice is. And with that, maybe I'll just turn it back over to Stephanie Coleman to begin the first session in our series. Thank you so much, Susan. And uh, yes, we're, we're very excited about this and we appreciate the opportunity to, uh, to bring this to, to the industry. So as uh, Susan mentioned, this is a four part series. And so today I'm going to be providing a, a sort of introduction or a foundation for uh, the conversation around sustainability, uh, energy and emissions in, in our particular, in our Canadian housing industry. And then part two, which is next week, uh, Chris Magwood, who is uh, an industry expert on this topic, uh, will be speaking about um, material selection. So what we're doing is kind of breaking uh, some of the information up into bite-sized uh, pieces. And so he's gonna be talking about material selections and um, and the and the embodied carbon on materials, and he will be joined later in the presentation by uh, Patrick uh, from Enercan, uh, talking about the uh, embodied carbon tool that uh, Enercan has developed. In part three, which is the week after, so this is a one, one week, uh, one day a, a week in the month of November. Um, he, Chris, will be joining us again, and he will be speaking about uh, a report that he did and some case studies uh, based on different archetypes. And then the fourth uh, part of the series, which is in the last week of November, we will be joined by three uh, builder industry experts uh, who are going down this path, and so we will be uh, doing a panel discussion, uh, getting some information from them. So, uh, so we are very excited about this. So for today, uh, I wanted to first provide a, a foundation or um, a background, or if you will, on sustainability. Uh, now, understanding that some, some people who are on this call may already be down this path and have this sort of information. What I discovered was a year ago, uh, I started a master's degree in, in essentially in sustainability. It's a master's of environment and business at the University of Waterloo. And I started to learn things that blew my mind. And I was like, how, how have I worked in the construction industry for so many years and not known this? And so I started asking around. I started asking um, other people in the industry, builders, renovators, um, you know, just uh, other, other industry people. And um, there seemed to be a bit of a knowledge gap for some um, and, and quite a few actually. And so uh, so what I thought would be good is to start this series by setting a, essentially a, a foundation. So I'll be talking about sustainability. I'll be shortly you know, speaking about social issues and environmental issues, uh, government and what's happening, uh, work that's being done. So I'll just be introducing you to some of these things. And then Chris, uh, in the next uh, couple of uh, episodes, we'll be digging deeper into that. And then at the end of today, Jeff Salazar from Enbridge will be presenting on uh, the renewable energy programs as, as Susan had alluded to. So I'll just dive right in and, uh, and begin. So I first wanted to introduce you to the, the three pillars of sustainability. And so these are uh, environment or our planet, the economy or profit or business, and then social or people. And it's basically how these three interact together. These are, these are considered forms of capital. It's how these three inter interact together um, that is what is sustainability. And the reality is with this, for any one of these pillars to be successful, they all need to be successful. We cannot only focus on, for example, the environment at the expense of the economy or people, neither can we just focus on people at the expense of the environment or business, or obviously focus just on a business at the expense of the environment or people. So all three of these are critical um, to our well-being as humans and uh, our survival and our sustainability. And so uh, these are the three foundational pillars that sustainability is built on. The triple bottom line is really kind of a, a business approach to this and it's understanding and, and what businesses are beginning to, to go down and realize and go down the the route that uh, when they do focus on environmental and uh, social type of issues within their business, um, they're finding that this is uh, there. There's a business case for it, and and that they're being um, successful essentially in in the uh, short and long term. 
So on the a brief uh, history of sustainability, so back in 1987, now this is not a comprehensive uh, history. There's way more work uh, and way more organizations that have been going on, but this is just kind of really high level, just to, to give you an idea that this just didn't start last year. Um, this has been going for many, many years and even predates 1987. But in 1987, uh, Gro Harlan Brundtland uh, had written uh, the report called Our Common Future, and that was written and commissioned by the United Nations. And that's kind of where the first definition of sustainable development and sustainability was, was defined. And then from there, every 10 years or so, the United Nations has been holding uh, Earth summits or world summits. And so you can see uh, that different uh, outcomes occurred at these different uh, 10 year uh, meetings. Now in 2015, and so you, you may have been hearing this COP26 uh, that's been in the news recently as in like today, because this is happening this week and, and next week, I believe. Um, COP26 is the Conference of the Parties. It's also the United uh, Nations, that basically their climate change conference. And so for COP21 that was held back in 2015, that was when the Paris Agreement uh, was signed. And so we've, we've, I'm sure all heard about that and I'll get into that in just a minute. But additional to the Paris Agreement were the 17 sustainable uh, development goals that were, that were outlined. And so these goals are, as you see here, um, you can see if you look at them, they really all fit within one of those three pillars that I talked about. You see no poverty, no hunger, you know, uh, gender equality, things like that. You know, those, of course, all fall into like the social components, whereas things like climate change, life below water, life on land, those sorts of things fall into the environmental and then things like decent work and economic growth, industry innovation, sustainable cities, things like that, you know, all fall into kind of the business, the economics um, side of things. And so, but as you can tell, these things are not uh, their own silos. They overlap just, just like that uh, diagram showed. So the first thing I'm going to touch on, and I'm not going to get too much into this, uh, but is, is on the social aspect of sustainability. And, and what I wanted to do was, um, if you haven't seen this already, I know I've talked about this quite a bit, but if you haven't seen this already, I wanted to uh, introduce you to the concept of uh, the housing continuum. And so you see, this is a, an, an, an image that I had found uh, on CMHC's website, but the Home Builders, Canadian Home Builders Association has also um, <clears throat> talked about this particular uh, continuum. And so you see on the far left side, you have you know, homelessness um, and then moves to emergency shelters, transitional social housing, and then starts moving into affordable housing and then into market uh, rate rental and also market rate home ownership. On the left, it's typically that uh, forms of housing and, and that sort of um, those sort of issues that people are dealing with are typically as associated with uh, poverty. So people that are homeless, you know, or uh, in emergency shelters, transitional, etc., uh, tend to uh, have a, a, a are less advantaged when it comes to economic. Um, uh, issues. It, whereas as you move towards the right of the continuum, you see that uh, that is more attributed to prosperity all the way through to home ownership. And of course, people desire to move toward the right or towards prosperity. And many people, in fact, desire home ownership. So for example, 94% of Canadians either already own their home, and I think our, our uh, home ownership rate is uh, close to 70, it's in the 60 to 70% range, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so 94% uh, of Canadians either own their homes or they rent at market rate. Uh, and about 80%, now this is before the this most recent kind of COVID slash housing boom that we've been having recently, but, um, about 80% of rental units that become available each year are actually because people are buying their first home. And now this number may be changing because we've seen uh, some significant price jumps in the cost of housing. So I think this number will need to be relooked at, but that has been historically um, the desire for people. They, they want to you know, get into market rate rental and then they want to, to own their own home for the most part. There's a few that still wanna rent of course, and that's okay, but uh, most people wanna buy their own home. 
Unfortunately, what happens though is when people can't buy a home, which we've started to see, uh, they end up remaining in rental uh, facilities, which is um, resulting in a bit of a, a backwards flow, uh, if you will, of this pipeline. So typically we want the pipeline to go toward the right, but it's it's moving in reverse. It's either stagnating or moving in reverse. And because of uh, there being a shortage of rental supply, I know in my own town where I, uh, where I live, the rental availability is incredibly low. And so what ends up happening, it's kind of your basic economic 101, um, the price of rent uh, skyrockets and, and goes up considerably. And that's what we've seen. Um, it, again, pushes people back a lot backward along the continuum. And for those who, you know, have good educations, have a good job, and historically would have been able to buy a home, uh, but due to various things, the cost of housing uh, increasing, or we've got, you know, mortgage rule changes, things like that, they're being forced to stay in rental. And what's happening is they're essentially transferring their wealth uh, to investors instead of being able to invest in themselves. Now there's different, you know, you know, um, comments that people will make about, well, you know, you don't have all the, you know, the property taxes, you don't have all these, these other, you know, maintenance and things like that. And, and certainly there are some things that are, that are true there, but I came across this stat from the Federal Reserve that is recent. It was released in September, 2020, and it talked about the, uh, the, the net worth. And so the median net worth of the U.S., um, homeowners, so homeowners, it's $255,000, whereas the net worth of renters is $6,300. So that's a almost $250,000 net worth uh, spread between that. And so that is, of course, something that is a big red flag to me because, you know, I'm hearing a number of people uh, in the industry uh, and not not just in the industry, but uh, colleagues like co colleagues in my in my my classes at school or um, other you know neighbors and things like that, talking about how difficult people are uh, having having a hard time uh, with being able to own a home. Um, there in part of the housing affordability issue is there's a lack of supply of housing. So there has been. Um, Generally speaking, there has been some lack of building, you know, entry level price point homes over the, the last number of years, coupled with uh, particularly the millennial generation, but then also the Gen Zs who are a little bit younger than the millennials, uh, beginning to come into this time in their life when they do want to, you know, uh, get married, uh, have children and start new households or, or um, couple together and start new households. And so, and then also, of course, you've got older generations who are beginning to look to, to downsize. So we've got a lack of supply issue, which is affecting housing affordability. We've all seen and heard the challenges with that have presented itself with um, with COVID, uh, with material prices increasing, particularly lumber and other things. Uh, but then, of course, we're seeing and we've been talking about for years the labor shortage, uh, which is, of course, uh, driving up the price of labor. Uh, again, it's at Economics 101. We don't have enough laborers. Their prices are going up. And then we're seeing this being particularly hit by a number of, of groups and where I'm seeing it, and, and I've inquired with other people and they're seeing it as well, uh, is the millennial generation. And I've heard uh, accounts where people are holding off having families because they're still living in their parents' basements, as an example. Uh, the Gen Zs who are, um, so millennials are about 40 or 41 years old and younger. Gen Zs are about 25 or so years and younger. But the other group that I'm seeing is divorcees of all ages, where maybe a, as a couple, uh, they were able to afford a home. Uh, now with um, the a separation and a divorce, they can't get back into home ownership, especially when housing prices have gone up. Um, so investors, what, and I'm talking to a number of builders across, uh, across the country, and uh, what I'm hearing is that in different areas, uh, more so than others, but Builders are beginning to see uh, an influx of investors buying uh, homes, particularly entry price point homes, and turning around and renting them to these people who otherwise would have bought those same homes. And so that goes back to uh, the concern that I have, particularly in the in the long run, in the net worth um, of families is uh, is the is the risk that uh, people are transferring their wealth to investors uh, when they otherwise would have preferred to have been a homeowner. So it's just something 
something to to think about. And uh, and I added on to here something that I've been personally uh, witnessing uh, recently is NIMBYism is alive and well. And so this is something that we also need to address um, as it relates to entry level uh, price point homes in in different uh, mixed communities that we're trying to uh, trying to build in different uh, in different cities and towns across the country. So that was the uh, sustainability, uh, uh, sorry, the social issues. And so now I'm gonna move on to the environmental, which is uh, where carbon comes into place. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, during the COP21 back in 2015, uh, that was when the, Par it, which was in Paris, that was in the Paris Agreement was signed. And it was signed by 196 uh, parties, basically countries, um, and it was a legally binding international treaty on climate change, and the goal is to keep emissions well below two degrees, but ideally less than one and a half degrees Celsius. And essentially what that means is we need to hit z net zero carbon emissions, not energy emissions, but carbon emissions by 2050. Now, in order to do that, uh, the United Nations Secretary General um, said that we need to, and so have scientists, I should clarify, um, have said that we need to cut our emissions in half in the next eight years. Now, when I think about emissions and where they come from, this sounds like a very onerous task. Um, you know, I think about homes, for example, who maybe have a gas furnace and a gas hot water tank. So how do you cut those emissions in half? Uh, you could replace, you know, the units. Will that get you there or do you need to um, to change them out? So so it's kind of one of these things where I don't know how we can cut our emissions in half. But what we're looking at is not just uh, in the housing industry, but also in other industries. So um, the mining industry or um, chemical industries and product manufacturers who are um, using certain agents that emit high carbon emissions, methane, things like that. So, um, so we need to look at the broader picture, not just focusing in on certain things, but looking at the full picture. And so we need to cut our emissions in half by uh, 2030. Now, Canada has committed uh, to cut their emissions by uh, 2050. And so have, as I mentioned, 195 other countries in addition to Canada. So let's take a look at carbon and GHG emissions and talk about those. So as I mentioned, you know, it's not just one type of, of uh, uh, product that creates emissions, but it's a wide range of products. And so uh, back uh, during the Kyoto Protocol, uh, when that was set up in uh, Kyoto, the, they had identified seven primary GHG emission uh, gases. And so the ones that are primarily impacting the construction industry from my study so far, and of course I'm, I'm continuing uh, to learn this over time, but uh, is, is the first three. So carbon dioxide, methane, and uh, nitri nitrous oxide. Uh, and, but there are some other ones of course as well and that, that are generated from all so uh, all forms. Uh, and so if you see the CO2E or the equivalent, I just wanted to introduce this to you because you will start to see this. Essentially what that is, is each one of these uh, natural gas, uh, each one of these gases um, or, or GHG emissions, I, I should say, greenhouse gas emissions, uh, have a different impact on the environment. And so in order to uh, kind of standardize things and simplify things, what they have done is created sort of a multiplier number that you multiply your emissions. So if you have methane emissions, for example, I think the multiplier is 28. Um, so you would take your methane emissions and you multiply it by 28, and that will give you the equivalent of the CO2 emissions. So that basically what we're looking at is just CO2, we're looking at the CO2 equivalent uh, total numbers just to simplify things. Because if we looked at this full list, it would get really complicated uh, very quickly. Now, as it relates to uh, business and carbon emissions and, um, and, and reporting of emissions, uh, so Canada has set up some, some guidelines and some mandates for uh, businesses or organizations that have to report. Uh, and I believe they have, if they exceed 10,000 uh, uh, metric tons of uh, carbon emissions, then they need to, to report or they're mandated to report. And so, 
it's, you know, when we think about the GHG emissions, these are, they're invisible and they come from all different forms, as I mentioned. And so it's kind of hard to get your head around, you know, how do you begin to even measure or, or calculate or, um, or even, um, kind of benchmark yourself to, to know that you're reducing emissions when they're coming from all sorts of forms. And so what has been developed are these three scopes. And so this is how a business would report uh, on their emissions. So scope one are what are called direct emissions. And so that would be, for example, if you had a factory, um, the, the company facility, uh, any sort of emissions that uh, were given off by uh, the company or any sort of uh, work vehicles or vehicles that were driven for the company. So those are direct emissions. Scope two, and that's scope one, scope two are indirect emissions. And so that, it, that comes from things like purchased electricity, steam, heating, cooling, that sort of thing for, for the business's use. And so in some cases, um, there are emissions that are generated in order to produce electricity, for example. So say if there were coal-fired um, uh, plants that generated electricity, then there are emissions uh, from that coal firing uh, that created the electricity that your business needed in order to operate. So those are called scope two indirect emissions. Scope three emissions are, are also indirect and they're basically everything else. And so just as an idea, uh, any sort of purchased goods and services like your supply chain, chain uh, falls in here. And just, so you see at the bottom here, it says upstream activities and then downstream activities. So you've got things like your purchased goods, your supply chain, you've got um, tr transportation distribution, uh, things like business travel uh, and waste, or even your employees commuting back and forth from home. Because if you didn't operate in a business where your employees uh, didn't commute back and forth uh, to work, then those emissions wouldn't have been generated. So, so it, 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 that's captured in scope three. Now scope three, it gets really complicated. And right now it's voluntary. Uh, so it's, but it's just something that I wanted to, to, uh, to put on your awareness. So there's kind of the upstream activities and then there's the downstream and that's taking, uh, so, you know, the, the products come into your facility, you manufacture them and then you sh ship them out uh, for homeowners uh, to use. So that, that's kind of the, the downstream activities. Hopefully that's clear. Now, um, the other thing too is that Chris will be getting more into this. I'm just actually uh, just in the middle of taking a carbon accounting course, so I'm early in my in my learning on this. But um, Chris, Chris uh, is more advanced on this, and so I'm really excited to to uh, hear what he has to say in the upcoming uh, webinars. Uh, and, and same thing with product life cycle. He, he is quite informed on this and, and will be able to provide uh, further information on this. So when we look at product life cycle, so this is essentially from the, uh, from the product's perspective and the emissions that are generated from the manufacturing of the product, what, we, uh, what terminology you will have heard of is uh, cradle to grave. Um, that's probably something that most people have heard of. And so you've got these different segments uh, that occur uh, as a product is manufactured. So if I were to use lumber as an example, the cradle is essentially the forest. And so we cut the trees down in the forest and that would be your raw material supply. It's, it's taken to the manufacturing and the board lumber is generated and it's sitting at the door of the, the lumber uh, mill ready to be shipped out to stores. So that would be the cradle to the gate. And then from the gate to practical completion is essentially where the materials are, are sent to stores, they arrive at your job site, and you build the home. So that's this kind of middle blue section. From there, it is the use of the, the home, which is essentially the homeowner has taken possession. If I'm using houses as an example, the homeowner takes possession of the home and they live in the home until the end of life of the home, which would be the home is torn down. Uh, and so in here, you see things like maintenance, repair, replacement, refurbishment. These are all things like, say, if you do a renovation in the home, 
the materials you bought, uh, as an example, uh, the carbon emissions would be something that that particular you know renovation company could account for in their in their emissions and in their work that they do. Um, but during the use of the home, not only are there the, the like the embodied carbon emissions, which is what I've been talking about uh, uh, for the cradle to gate and then gate to practical completion, but there's also what is called the operational uh, emissions. And that's what we have been focusing on uh, as it relates to energy efficiency. So energy efficiency falls into the operation of the home, while the um, embodied carbon is essentially the, the materials and, the, and the, um, the building of the home itself. And then of course, then we have the end of life, uh, which takes you to, to, the, to the grave, from the end of life to the grave, uh, where it's either recycled or where it's disposed. So what's the difference? I've kind of alluded to what the difference between operational embodied carbon is, but I'll just go into just a little bit more detail and then Chris will get into more detail even further. So, um, so operational carbon emissions essentially is the emissions that are generated, in this case, a home, uh, during its life. So I, I mentioned that. So the homeowner takes possession of the home. They uh, have you know whatever it is that they have that's uh, whether it's propane or or natural gas or or uh, you know some other means of uh, oil or something like that. Um, those are the operational carbon emissions. And so the work that we've been doing over the years has really been focusing on reducing energy consumption in order to reduce these operational carbon emissions. Whereas the embodied carbon are the emissions that are generated in the making of the material that the home is built with, along with the emissions from actually constructing the house as well. So hopefully that uh, makes sense. So if you were to look at this chart again, or the, um, you know, the, the life cycle, essentially you've got the embodied carbon in this, it, it, that goes really throughout, but the operational or the energy efficiency uh, piece as it relates to the house itself uh, falls in this one uh, green category right here. So hopefully that is uh, that is clear. Now, um, so who are the emissions offenders? So when we look at the different industries um, in Canada, we see a number of different ones. And so these are just not, um, uh, there's many different uh, uh, industries that are, that are alluded to here, but these are just some of the key ones. So we've got oil and gas industry, we've got transportation industry, we've got the electricity industry, like I mentioned with, uh, with um, coal fired. Now in Canada, that's less uh, an issue as it is in other countries where they do more coal burning. We've got heavy industry is another big uh, emitter. We've got agriculture, waste, but uh, buildings are the third uh, as it relates to both operational as well as um, materials or embodied emissions. And so the, the Canada the Green Building Council had mentioned that 30% um, of all emissions uh, for buildings come from the materials and the operations. So essentially the embodied carbon and the operational uh, carbon emissions. Now, whoops. Now, what is really interesting, now let me just make sure, yes, there we go. Um, so now what is really interesting is to see what is happening uh, on the industry front. And so the energy industry actually has begun to realize that, or not just begun to realize, they've known, they've uh, started to, to acknowledge and to uh, set goals for uh, the 2050 targets, just as uh, the United Nations has been uh, encouraging people to do. And so we've got, these are just some examples of some industry leaders in the uh, oil and gas industry who have actually started to shift toward energy industry instead of just oil and gas and um, and are now embracing other uh, renewable type of energies. And so that's why it's it's uh, super exciting that Enbridge is uh, sponsoring this and also is going to be talking about some of that renewable uh, programs and energy sources that they are uh, that they've been uh, developing and rolling out. So we've got BP, for example, that have set the 2050 goal to achieve net zero emissions. Shell Oil has done the same thing and so has uh, Enbridge. And so we'll hear more from Jeff uh, later on in today's uh, session. But it's not just uh, the um, energy industry that is moving in this direction, the automotive industry. So um, vol like here's just a, a handful of some of the key uh, auto manufacturers that are 
investing significantly into electrification of vehicles. And so you see here, you've got Honda at 58 billion in the next couple of years. You've got 11 billion from Ford within the next year, uh, 60 billion from Mercedes, et cetera. So you've got, and these are just some of them. This isn't necessarily a comprehensive list. So we've got automotive industry is moving rapidly toward electrification uh, in the next handful of years and with some setting some pretty significant targets by 2030. For example, Volvo um, saying that they'll be all electric by 2030. And we're actually seeing adoption of this. You don't have to go very far to see um, many electric vehicles on uh, the roads and also more of the electric uh, chargers that are beginning to, to pop up in different areas. And, and we're seeing a, a wider adoption of this. And so for, for builders in the industry, something that you'll, on the website, um, sorry, on the webinar, you'll want to start thinking about this uh, because this is something that, you know, you may, you may start hearing about, or you may start hearing customers asking to have EV chargers uh, put into their home, especially as um, the cost of EVs start to come down and their um, their performance uh, goes up. So of course, we're still in kind of earlier stages, but uh, there's some significant investment happening in the auto industry. The food industry and agriculture, um, so you saw that they were, they were high on the list as far as emissions. Um, are concerned. And so these are, again, just a handful of uh, the food industry that's moving forward, making uh, some bold uh, um, commitments to, to reducing their emissions. So you see here, you know, by 2030, by 2040, some pretty significant uh, emissions like Nestle, for example, uh, say that they will achieve net zero emissions by 2050. Maple Leaf Foods actually um, through, through purchasing offsets have been able to be carbon neutral already uh, in the last uh, couple of years. And so we see um, movement on this front from the, uh, the food industry. The financial industry is one that, um, is, is one that I think is going to be a, a very significant player uh, in pushing people forward and pushing business forward uh, on this, uh, on sustainability and on moving uh, the needle on emissions. And so for example, um, RBC has uh, set a goal in the next couple of years that they will uh, reduce their emissions by 70%, but then also moving to 100% renewable energy for all of their electricity. And setting 2050 goal for net zero emissions uh, reductions in its lending. So I'll talk about that in just a second. Then we've got BMO uh, who are making some um, commitments as well as TD and, and CIBC. And of course there are others, but these were just uh, four of our top five banks in Canada. And you'll notice underneath the banks, they have um, also started to align their business operations with the 17 sustainable development goals that I had alluded to earlier. So you'll start to see particularly publicly traded businesses, uh, but you'll start to see businesses start to align with these. And uh, it, it, when you start digging into it and looking at sustainability reports and stuff, you'll, you'll start to see uh, this pop up. Now, the reason I think the financial industry is going to be a big uh, influence in uh, moving emissions toward the 2050 uh, goal of zero, zero emissions um, is because I, I was on a webinar uh, recently. It was a global webinar that was uh, held by The Economist, the magazine The Economist, and they had some very high level um, industry leaders on there, including from the banking industry. And a question was posed to some of the banking uh, leaders asking, well, if you're moving toward these emissions reductions in your own operations uh, and in your investment portfolio, like the ESG investments, um, what do you do with companies that uh, borrow from you? What are, what are your plans on that? And so the response was, at least from one or two, was, well, if we choose to lend to these companies that have not addressed emissions and moved towards emissions reductions, if, if we choose to lend to them, it's possible that they would need to pay a premium for that lending. And so what we're starting to see is this pressure that's coming from, from different sides, but even from the investor side. And so what I've been uh, reading in some of my studies is that ESG investments that uh, some of the banks or many of the banks are beginning to roll out. These are environment, social and governance um, ESG is that that's what it stands for. Um, these investments are, are beginning to actually outperform 
uh, traditional investments. And so these investments are really geared toward different either environmental or social type of issues or causes, and they can have different themes to them. And so they're beginning to outperform traditional investments. And so then, of course, um, investors are beginning to start uh, to pay attention to this as well. In fact, separate but related, I was speaking with a um, uh, a, a manufacturer not that long ago, and they were saying that they were getting a lot of questions from investors on what they're doing on the sustainability front. And so we're, we're beginning to see this uh, uh, increase more and more. So in the home building industry, uh, again, we're starting to see uh, companies. So on the left, uh, and these are just a, a sample of, of a few, uh, on the left are some uh, Canadian companies. So we've got Minto and, and Concert Properties uh, who have both uh, published, uh, publicly published sustainability reports. And on the right are just uh, three of um, U.S. publicly traded builders uh, who have been uh, going down this path as well and are actually publishing uh, sustainability or ESG reports, and in some cases, even uh, reporting on carbon emissions and that sort of thing. So, so we're starting to see the home building industry move in this direction. And so what we're seeing now is that the industry... And it's not, of course, just housing. Of course, that's that you know that's that's what we're focusing on today. But it's not just housing. It's as I mentioned, all the industries. You got agriculture and food and automotive and all these different industries are beginning to feel this uh, pressure from all sides. Uh, whether it's you know investors, we've got government uh, government uh, who who are putting in uh, certain um, regulations. We've got competitors who are leading the charge, creating pressure, um, and in consumers and banks and you know, all these different groups, but another really interesting one, and this is particularly um, important as I see so many help wanted signs go up where we've got uh, seemingly a, a shortage of laborers uh, and uh, in all industries, not just in construction, but particularly in, in construction, but particularly the younger generations are far more selective with who they are willing to work for. And as part of the hiring process and, and as part of, of the work that they do, they are, they are very concerned that the company that they work for uh, has the same values uh, that are aligned with theirs. And what we know from research is that particularly the, the younger generation um, you know, are quite concerned about environment and social issues. And you don't even have to go very far on social media to, to see that is true. So industry as a whole is starting to feel this pressure uh, from all sides on the environment and the social uh, side. Um, so we need to go back to that triple bottom line and look at how we can set up our businesses to address you know, the, the, the social and the environmental issues while also uh, putting that essentially as a competitive uh, advantage and being profitable and successful in the long run with that. And, and there is evidence uh, that that is completely doable. So let's look at government. And so, uh, so as I mentioned, the Canadian government has um, set emissions uh, targets of net zero uh, by 2050. And so the, the Canadian government has uh, committed to uh, cut our GHG emissions by 40 to 40 5% uh, below the 2005 uh, baseline. And then of course, at, at 2050 uh, hit actual net zero. And so what the Canadian government has done is they have created uh, the Pan-Canadian framework. And this framework has essentially four pillars. Uh, there's pricing carbon. So we've we started to see that, um, uh, the uh, carbon tax. Uh, there's further uh, emissions reductions uh, just throughout uh, the economy and in different industry, um, adapting to the impacts of climate change and building resiliency. And this is a big one that uh, us in our construction industry uh, need to be very aware of, especially as insurance companies uh, start to pay even more attention to this as well. Um, and then of course, uh, one of the other pillars is to accelerate innovation and uh, create jobs. Now, Digging deeper into the Pan-Canadian framework uh, as it relates to the built environment, they specifically said, uh, the Canadian government said they would like to uh, hit net zero um, model code by 2030 and then have a model code uh, for existing buildings by 2022. Now, I have... Um, uh, expressed interest in volunteering on that, uh, the development of the uh, existing buildings model code, and I, I believe it has not started yet. Um, so that date, the 2022 date, may uh, 
be it may take a little bit longer so we'll see i don't have that information right now but i believe it's um it's a little bit delayed the the current uh, the 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 other model code uh for new homes particularly in the energy model code um that one uh was supposed to be released a little while ago i think the new date is uh the beginning of december uh for this year so we should see something uh on the release of that pretty soon uh and then of course there, there were some additional things like uh, uh new standards for heating uh, equipment and uh, collaboration with indigenous peoples on uh, building and renovating programs so the province of Ontario uh, has uh, set some emissions reduction targets. So uh, as, as you can see here, they're modernizing uh, you know, the building code and in fact have uh, harmonized with the, or have uh, uh, confirmed to harmonize with the national building code, uh, which should happen a roughly a year and a half or so after uh, we see the national building code. So the province of Ontario is looking to do that, um, but also so are uh, all of the other uh, provinces, they're looking at uh, making some changes as well. There we go. Sorry, my screen's kind of jumping around on me. Um, so all of the provinces and territories have, have created their own uh, climate change strategies. So uh, if you haven't uh, looked at yours for your province, it does exist. And, um, and if you can't find it, uh, just let me know. I can, uh, I can send that out to you. We're also now seeing, so you, you saw we have it at a global scale, then we have it at a national scale, uh, we have it at a provincial scale, but now we're also starting to see uh, municipalities moving in this direction with uh, green development uh, standards and energy plans. And these are just some in my area here um, in, in Ontario that we're seeing, as well as uh, the city of Vancouver. And uh, I'm sure there are more. This is uh, just to introduce to you the idea that municipalities are starting to look at um, their own standards um, and some of which uh, may exceed the the work that the even than the than the building code. That's what we're starting to see. So on the national building code. So as I mentioned, it looks like um, it will be released in December of this year. So next month. And um, as I had also mentioned, with there's the goal is to move towards net zero energy ready uh, model code by 2030. We have uh, pretty much all of the provinces have adopted it. Some with um, kind of. Uh, uh, addendums to it or, or supplemental pieces to it. And so we're beginning to see that harmonization across, uh, across Canada on the building code. Now, again, the, it the code has not been officially launched, so this could change, but generally speaking, this is, um, seems to be the current trajectory for it, uh, where you've got uh, your tier one, uh, your tier two, and then all the way up to tier five by about 2030 or so. And uh, so what we see here, I've just put some uh, energy labeling programs to give you an idea uh, the, the the building code is based on energy, so operational carbon emissions that we talked about. And so what it looks like at this point in time is that um, somewhere between tier four and tier five is where net zero ready falls. Um, so there's still some work being done on this. I don't have that uh, particular information at this point in time, but there, there's still some work to be done, uh, being done on that tier five uh, to find out kind of where that will land and when. Uh, so just to give you an idea for the province of Ontario, uh, whoops, I went a little too far. Uh, for the province of Ontario, our current building code, uh, from what I've been uh, advised, uh, falls really at tier two. So our base minimum for the building code is at about tier two of the, uh, the five tiers of the national building code. So as I mentioned, you know, we've got uh, the, the building code and then we've got various uh, labeling programs. And so uh, some of the ones that are shown here like Energy Star, R2000, Interguide, Net Zero, uh, these are all really based around the operational um, emissions of uh, the home and as is the, is the building code. And so the opportunity is really to begin to expand our viewpoint and to look at not just the operational side, but also all emissions 
emotions, um, including the embodied side, because it is possible um, that we could, in an effort to reduce carbon emissions, we could actually be generating more emissions um, in the long run uh, if we're not mindful of the materials uh, that we're using. So we need to be aware of this um, and, and to look to that. And so that's where Chris, uh, in episode two and three of the series, will be uh, providing some insights for us. So some work that's being done right now is uh, on uh, is from Natural Resources Canada. So I wanted to just introduce these to you. And of course, uh, at, uh, next week when, when uh, Chris is on, he will speak more to some of these uh, pieces. But um, so uh, I, as you know, uh, for energy modeling, uh, what is commonly used like for Energy Star, CHBA, EnerGuide, that sort of thing, uh, is EnerCAN's Hot 2000 modeling software. What EnerCAN has also developed is the HTAP tool. So it is a housing technology assessment platform, um, as well as the cost benefit analysis tool. And so what these do is essentially run about 100,000 different combination scenarios based on your house uh, specs that you're looking for to come up with the most cost effective option for you or technology for you uh, for your home um, that meets the the most you know energy efficient as well so it, it takes it looks at the energy efficiency um, of the different piece of the different components in the home as well and layers on pricing to come up with the most cost effective um, way in which to reduce your um, your operating emissions and so this is something that um, that is free uh, for the industry and Natural Resources Canada offers that. So again, if this is something that you're interested in, of course, let me know what I could do perhaps is in the resource email, I could uh, send out some information um, on these tools so that you could get this. So another tool that has been uh, developed, and so I'm not going to speak too much to it other than just to say that this is what Chris will be talking about in episode two, is the uh, the material embodied carbon calculator. And so basically what that does is it's a tool that um, that EnerCAN has developed uh, in conjunction with Chris's work uh, to identify uh, materials using uh, environment uh, product uh, documents that show uh, the emissions that the that the product um, essentially generated in its in its production. Um, so they use these EPDs and uh, plug those into this uh, calculator that they've created in order to figure out the embodied um, emissions in the materials that the home is built with. Now, not all products uh, come with EPDs. So there are some limitations, but Chris can go into the details of that uh, when he speaks to it next week. But I just wanted to give you an idea um, on this, uh, this life cycle assessment. Um, now, 50% is just one example of some savings that can be done. Uh, it actually can be even much higher. I think Chris was finding that it could be 70 or more percentage um, of the emissions uh, in the home is related to the materials. And so uh, what this calculator essentially looks at is the cradle to gate uh, segment of um, the product life cycle. So anyways, Chris will get into more details on that, but uh, just to give you a flavor of what you'll, you'll be uh, learning about uh, next week, this is an, an example of insulation, for example. So we've got fiberglass loose Bill, an average uh, carbon emissions are like in this case kilograms of, of CO2 equivalent emissions is uh, 296, whereas if you were to look at cellulose, it's actually a negative number. Um, and that's because cellulose is uh, essentially made of wood, which absorbs carbon emissions instead of emitting carbon emissions. So that's just kind of one example. Uh, another example here would be uh, wood frame construction versus steel studs. So uh, this was uh, two by six uh, steel framing uh, where you've got the emissions at about 2200. While if you were to use lumber for a two by six, you're looking at 257 kilograms of CO2e emissions. So you can see a very big difference in the emissions in the, in the materials that are used. And so this is what I mean when I say we want to kind of broaden our horizon outside of just energy efficiency and look to the bigger picture, uh, including embodied carbon to make sure that we're not doing um, 
more damage than, than good uh, in our efforts to, to reduce um, uh, energy and to reduce emissions. Chris also, uh, in conjunction with uh, Natural Resources Canada and Builders for Climate Action, uh, created this fantastic report. Again, I can provide this uh, for you in the resource email. It's uh, a great read and it goes over um, some case studies uh, and some research that he had done. And some of the things that they discovered, which are quite fascinating were uh, material selections can significantly impact the home's total carbon emissions when you consider the full picture, uh, either positively or negatively without changing the home design or the energy performance. So that's what I mean, you know, if you were to use say steel studs versus wood studs, you could increase the carbon emissions, but yet at the end of the day, it looks like the same type of home and the energy performance of the home looks the same because you know the steel studs versus wood studs say framing in a basement or something like that um, may not have impacted the emissions or, or the um the energy performance that much um three kind of uh, key emitters or key offenders i guess you could say would be uh, the concrete insulation and exterior cladding uh, so those were some of the highest em uh, emitters uh, in in the materials that were used uh, the electrical grid actually can have a very significant impact uh, on the embodied carbon emissions of a product. So that needs to be factored in, or you want that to be factored in when you're looking at the full, picture, uh, the full picture um, uh, of the emissions of your home. And um, so the fourth point is, you know, energy codes typically increase insulation. Of course, that makes sense because we've been trying to reduce energy, um, e energy consumption, uh, but that could, as I outlined, could potentially increase embodied emissions if you're only looking at the energy side. So again, looking at the big picture. And another interesting point was some low carbon materials also are low priced materials. Some are high price materials. There's no real um, kind of, uh, you know, uh, it, 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 it just fluctuates. It, it depends. Like, so, so there's not any sort of common, uh, you know, occurrences of this. But so it's, a, it's about researching each thing, looking at the right balance um, to look and, and looking at the full picture um, to result in low embodied emissions uh, while also uh, working on reducing your operating emissions. So it's really a sustainability balancing act. Um, you know, I talked first about the social issues I've, and now I've talked about the environmental issues, but also understanding, you know, we want to keep housing affordable. Um, we can't necessarily just drive up the price of housing so much to save the environment that people can't afford to, to buy them or live in them. So we have to balance that out. Um, and we also want to, of course, make sure that these homes are durable, comfortable, that sort of thing. Um, we also, but of course, we do need to uh, reduce our environmental impact and do that while also maintaining an economic uh, stability. So it's no small feat. Uh, it is something that is um, it is a challenge uh, for all of us, but uh, so many are starting to or have been down this path um, and are really leading the charge on this. What we've heard from the industry, I've been speaking to the industry recently um, and, and asking some of the challenges that they're, they're experiencing just in general, uh, but have an impact on, on, on the sustainability aspects. And they said labor shortages, uh, trades and labor shortages is one of the biggest challenges that they're facing. Uh, training of trades and the knowledge gap um, there is another big issue um, that can actually make it challenging for builders to want to change or adopt change because um, if the if the trades are not trained then that becomes kind of a domino effect of uh, of, of challenges that then need uh, remediation um, so it becomes a real uh, difficult uh, experience for them. So labor shortages coupled with uh, sort of a knowledge gap or trades training is, is really critical. Uh, materials, so of course we've had a lot of volatility simply because of COVID, um, but that has uh, created some challenges and some of the builders are finding like looking at trying to implement different things sometimes can get uh, some resistance from, municip from municipalities uh, in approving different products or um, uh, you know, different assembly techniques, that sort of thing. So, uh, you know, in speaking, actually, I, I spoke with the, the, the Ontario Building Officials uh, Association at their conference uh, last month. And um, 
And they said, you know, a good approach for this is to come to them very early on, not kind of when you're applying for the permit with the different technologies or materials, but come to them early on so that they can work those uh, sorts of things through uh, so that when it comes time for the permitting, uh, it, um, it, it is a lot smoother at that stage. Of course, um, that, that's a perfect scenario. Sometimes these things uh, surprise us and, and we're kind of reacting, but uh, that, that was some feedback that they had provided. Uh, and then time. I mean, everybody is just swamped right now. And, um, and we've got very busy uh, schedules and the reality is, you know, mistakes can happen and mistakes occur. And so these are some of the challenges that I'm hearing from the industry. So considerations going forward, is, as I mentioned a few times, we should start to look at the full picture. So look at the overall emissions, not just energy, but also the embodied emissions. Start to begin to understand that fuller picture and take that next step. I mean, it goes beyond that as well, but take that next step because that's a big one uh, to begin to understand the fuller picture and uh, the impact that it has and look for ways um, that you can achieve total emissions reductions while also saving money, uh, because that is a possibility. And uh, as Chris had alluded to from his report, that which, by the way, he'll be speaking on in the third episode of this webinar series. Um, learn about sustainability, climate change risks, and the, the, and the impact on your business or the potential impact on your business. So I talked about the banks and lending, insurance, uh, municipalities are starting to move down uh, this path. And so what there, there's essentially, you know, some business um, risk factors. Uh, if things start to change very quickly, you know, we're talking about cutting carbon emissions in half in the next eight years. So I expect things will accelerate. We'll start to see acceleration in this very quickly. Um, so start to learn about this um, for your own business uh, so that your business is, is set up and resilient to be able to handle the, the big changes that we're, I anticipate uh, will be coming down the pipe. Of course, don't forget uh, building science and the house is a system. Uh, we need to always make sure that whatever we do uh, on the emissions and the energy side, we need to be paying attention to that water management, the air tightness, the humidity control um, to ensure that our homes are healthy, durable and efficient uh, to live in. And lastly, I wanted to say that, you know, the reality is we're all in this together. Um, this, we need to really think about a balanced and collaborative approach. Um, looking at collaboration with industry, with stakeholders, with municipalities, because I think, it, you know, we're, we're all kind of moving in the same direction, but how can we collectively work together so that we can achieve these, uh, these goals while also uh, seeking that uh, triple bottom line. So it's good for business, it's good for the planet, and it's good for people. So that is what I had to share with you today. And I see that there's a question and some comments in the chat. What I thought I would do, if it's all right with you, is I'll hand it over to Jeff, and then we'll save the uh, questions for the end. Jeff, does that work for you? I see he's just joining yep. us right now. Hi, Jeff. Yep, How are great, you? Stephanie. Good, thank you. How is okay. everyone on the call today? That's good. Uh, great content today. Lots of uh, exciting stuff and uh, new content I myself haven't even seen, so. Oh, good. Great. Well, I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> I always worry that people are already down this path and know it, but I'm glad that uh, that that's been helpful. So, um, so while much. you're presenting, I'll take a look at the Q and A, and then we can uh, wrap up at the very end with some uh, with some uh, question and answers. Certainly, I'll try to keep it brief, so we have lots of time for questions on your content and mine, if there are any. Uh, can I share my screen here? Yes, you should be able to. Uh, no, it says you have blocked me. Oh, <laughs> that was not intentional. Let me uh, let me just find that. Um, that's odd. Uh, hmm. Uh, I'm going to, what I'm going to do is I'm going to make you co-host and that should fix that. Let's see if that works. I'm sorry about that. I'm not sure why that happened. I'm not sure how to. Uh... Yep, there we go. That allows... Oh, perfect. Okay, great. Perfect. So if ever, if you can just confirm everyone can see that. Yes. Great. I'm just going to switch to presentation mode here. There we go. 
Uh, great. Well, thanks, Stephanie, for uh, allowing me to speak. Just a free a few brief moments here on some of the projects and activities Enbridge is doing in the low carbon space. So as you're aware, we're a large natural gas distributor, uh, but we are actively looking at activities that we can do to help reduce not only our operational emissions here at Enbridge, but also uh, to the end use customers that we supply fuel and energy to. Um, so we've been active, very active in the energy conservation space for several decades with our demand side management programs, which incentivize uh, energy efficiency upgrades such as insulation and windows or upgrading from a standard to a high efficiency furnace. Um, we're also looking at uh, a number of pilots with hybrid heating systems where we're incorporating a, an air source heat pump added on to an existing natural gas burning fur furnace to help reduce, further reduce energy consumption and gas consumption at the building, thereby lowering carbon emissions. Uh, we're also investigating a number of different technologies, including natural gas heat pumps, which would drive the efficiency of the natural gas burning of the fuel up over 100%, which hasn't been done in the past. Um, along with conservation programs, we're looking at a number of non-gas solutions, which I'm going to speak to specifically today. But we're also trying to green our, green our fuel um, through a hydrogen program we're doing with a power to gas system that uses excess renewable energy to create hydrogen which we are then blending into our natural gas to reduce the carbon intensity of that fuel that's delivered to our customers. And we're also very active in the renewable natural gas space. Um, for those of you on the call that aren't aware what, nat what RNG is, it's essentially um, a natural gas alternative that has lower carbon emissions and carbon abatement abilities because of the methane emissions that are typically uh, experienced with off-gassing of the decomposition of green bin waste material or through agricultural processes. So we're actively pursuing projects where we can take that methane uh, emission uh, from either an agricultural process or the waste, waste uh, collected by municipalities clean it, um, scrub it, bring it to pipeline quality gas and inject it back into our system. Again, uh, lowering the overall carbon emissions of our fuel as, or that are associated with our fuel. Uh, a big ticket item right now is also carbon capture. As Stephanie mentioned, it's, it's very challenging to cut emissions by 50% without reducing uh, or eliminating particular burning of natural gas or fuels. So capturing that carbon that is emitted from the appliance that appliances that need to stay in, in activity, uh, that's going to be a key focus for us and for the industry as a whole to try to reduce that overall carbon. We're going to have to burn fuel for certain processes, especially on the industrial side. So if we can capture that carbon uh, before it gets into the atmosphere, store it, utilize it for other purposes, uh, a lot of focus on that right now. And of course, fuel switching or, or more gas is what we consider. So replacing uh, other fuel types like oil, propane and wood that are used for home and uh, home heating and water heating, uh, switching those and, and providing a lower carbon intensity natural gas solution for those customers. We're also actively pursuing um, and, and expanding our compressed natural gas program. Um, we currently are 100% uh, supplied by natural gas for our own fleet vehicles. Natural gas does have lower uh, tailpipe emissions uh, compared to natural gas or compared to conventional gasoline and diesel. Um, so we're looking at expanding that business. Uh, we've just partnered with a, a number of uh, service providers. Uh, we have a, a fueling station on the 401 now. So essentially transportation, uh, large transport trucks and fleet vehicles can fuel up uh, all the way from Sarnia straight out to the Montreal border or the uh, Quebec border. So lots of activity. We are working on getting our, our net zero target for 2050. Uh, we're currently working on operational and uh, also scope three. Um, as Stephanie mentioned, scope three is, is a bit of a challenge. Um, and again, because we're one of the largest natural gas distributors, that's one of our key focuses. So today I'm going to speak about the non-gas solutions that we're actually working on. So although we are a natural gas utility, we are looking at providing services and technologies that will help our customers provide heating and cooling uh, and domestic hot water heating using something other than natural gas. So today I'm gonna to speak a little bit about geothermal heating and cooling systems. Uh, these are clean renewable energy technology that's used for space conditioning as well as domestic hot water production. It can be implemented in as small as a single family home all the way up to multi-unit residential buildings and commercial applications. Uh, they do provide efficiencies of 
up to 500%. So that's one unit of energy in, which is electricity, clean, uh, clean in Ontario anyways. Uh, and it will reject uh, five units of, en of energy into the home. So 500% efficiency, drastically higher than any other technology that's currently available in the space heating sector. Uh, again, it's an electric based heat pump system that leverages the, the stored energy in the ground. So there are zero on site carbon emissions associated with this technology. So by what Stephanie had mentioned earlier, to reduce by 50%, you can't really just eliminate your heating requirement, the building still needs heat, and it still needs hot water, this technology will provide that with zero carbon. Uh, these systems have been in use for 30 years in Canada, if not longer. Um, and they do, like I said, utilize heat pump technology coupled with a heat exchanger that's in the ground that absorbs the thermal energy, low grade thermal energy that's stored in the earth by solar radiation every day. So these systems are fully reversible. They flip into cooling and reject that heat and humidity load in the building into the ground during the cooling month, during the cooling months or summer. Um, what's really stifled the adoption of these systems is that expensive ground heat exchanger. It's costly, it's technology specific, it needs specialized equipment and skills to install. And it's really um, the upfront cost is what's kept this from really taking off. And our program is designed to sort of eliminate that. Um, I'll go back one slide. As you can see in this image here, this is a single home with a single loop. This is the most cost effective to way to implement these systems, but they can also be expanded into full community-based systems. Uh, network geothermal systems would use a common heat exchanger or a number of connected, interconnected, heat exchangers in the ground to provide thermal energy to each of the buildings in the community. So these, these type of applications work really well in a mixed uh, density, mixed application community where there's some commercial that has year round cooling loads and residential that has heating and cooling loads throughout the year. Um, so these systems are great for medium density applications. Uh, they do have their limitations. Uh, again, more infrastructure in the ground more costly to install. Uh, but again, we are looking at these as, as a potential opportunity for different communities. Um, another opportunity for geothermal air would be a central plant geo system, which would be a single individual large heat exchanger in the ground connected to a energy center that houses high capacity heat pump systems. So in this case, as opposed to distributing low temperature thermal energy to each of the buildings, we're collecting that thermal energy or exchanging it with the ground and providing uh, the boost of energy or the rejection of energy through a central plant and then distributing hot or chilled water to each of the buildings. This provides for simplified mechanicals at the building level. So there's no combustion required. There's no heat pumps required in each of the buildings. You simply have a water to water heat exchanger, uh, very similar to a district energy system. These are also very, uh, um, great for uh, incorporating other technologies such as solar thermal or potentially sewage waste heat, which we're also investigating. Um, but basically it's, it's a, an entire community-based system. So just like our natural gas network where we will feed the entire community with natural gas to provide heating and domestic hot water, this central plant type system does the same thing. We're just distributing hot water and we're generating that through uh, low carbon heat pump electric based systems. Um, so a fabulous, pro fabulous technology, but again, cost has been an issue on this technology. The heat exchangers range anywhere from ten to twenty thousand dollars for an average home. So uh, homeowners that are struggling with with getting into that home market, like Stephanie mentioned, the higher cost of homes being built today. Um, our program is designed to provide that turnkey geothermal infrastructure at no upfront cost. So the developer, builder, and the homeowner purchasing that home has no upfront capital cost associated with the system. We would provide that, um, that design, construction, and sales support for the geo system, uh, ongoing operation and maintenance, uh, including performance monitoring of the system to ensure it works. And we're taking that technology risk away from the builders and the homeowners. Uh, if you were to buy your own geothermal system, it typically comes with a 10 year warranty on that heat exchanger. In year 11, if it fails, that technology failure is on the homeowner at the end of the day, and they have to invest in a new heat exchanger or expensive repairs to it. So our program takes that technology risk away. We assume that liability and ensure that that system's operating for the life of the contract. 
Um, again, we can do this single loop per building, uh, micro district applications servicing multiple buildings, which is really great for block townhomes or stacked uh, towns or lane towns, uh, multi-unit residential buildings, multiples of them on one property. Um, or we can do full community-based systems either through an ambient loop or central plant district system. Currently, our program does offer the no upfront cost solution for the geothermal heat exchanger only, but we are looking at developing uh, a more robust program where the heat pumps are also included. But our current program allows the builders to utilize their existing HVAC trades to provide the tin work, the electrical connections, the plumbing, and all of the building code related stuff associated with that heat pump installation we would provide the geothermal loop asset, brought it in, bring it into the mechanical room and provide um, a list of geo contractors that are certified to install this technology and commission it accordingly so that it's working and providing the energy that it's supposed to provide. Um, in regards to how does this look at the end of the day to the customers, um, we have a number of different programs and it really depends on the project and, and the counterparty that we're working with. So for a single family home with a single loop application, it's a lease type agreement, very similar to your rental water heater process where you the customer would sign a, a clause in the APS of the sale of the home and they would agree to a monthly geothermal fee based on the system capacity that is installed at their home. So we can do the entire community and each individual home based on the size of that home and the size of the heat exchanger would have a monthly fee associated with the capacity that they have. It is a fixed term contract. We're able to stretch that contract over a very long period of time, similar to our gas assets. So the monthly rates would be much lower than if you were to put this on a, a short term 10 year loan or put it on a line of credit, even a 25 year mortgage or a line of credit on, on the mortgage. Uh, we're stretching these terms out over 40 years to keep that monthly fee low for the end user. Uh, there is a buyout option so they can purchase it if they come into a cash windfall. Um, but during the term of that contract, again, we're covering all maintenance and all repairs associated with that. If we have to drill a new loop in year 27, that's covered under that monthly fee and the customer just continues paying that. Um, as we get into larger systems or uh, commercial business to business relationships where we're dealing with condos or commercial properties or entire communities, we're looking at more of an energy as a service model where we can charge a flat fee, uh, sort of a capacity charge again, based on the amount of energy that system's in, uh, likely going to require during peak periods. And then a metered, a combination of possibly a metered energy charge for the actual energy that's being rejected and to and from our heat exchanger system throughout the term of the contract. Uh, very flexible terms on the service model. We can range from 15 to 35, 40 years again, amortizing that over a longer period, bringing the monthly fees down. And again, it comes with a performance guarantee on energy costs and the efficiency of the system. Um, so just a number of things that we're looking at in geothermal. We have a couple of projects coming up in 2022 uh, in the low rise residential sector and the mid rise sector. Um, so we're ex excited to uh, really expand on this program and start offering it uh, broadly, more broadly across Ontario. Another one of the opportunities and programs that we're developing is solar. So as Stephanie touched on net zero ready, uh, really the difference between net zero ready and a net zero home is that solar PV system that's on the roof, creating the energy that the, uh, an equal amount of energy that the home is consuming throughout the year. Again, a capital intensive uh, aspect to building these homes. That solar PV system is costly. Um, so we are developing a program where we would cover that upfront cost, work with a solar expert in the industry, work with the builder, design a, an array that fits properly on that home uh, that provides 100% of the energy required if you're looking to get to net zero. And we would cover that full cost associated with the design, engineering and installation. We also take that technology risk away. So during the term of that contract, we're providing turnkey service maintenance and operational uh, reporting on the actual energy generated. This solar program will be able to take advantage of any net metering programs where they're available uh, based on the local distribution company. Um, and that benefit goes directly to the homeowner. This is not a we'll rent your roof off you and we'll take the benefits of the net metering or the fit contract. This is a financing option to bring solar systems to the homeowner at a low monthly cost that will typically be equivalent to the energy that they've saved thereby covering their monthly fees to us with the energy that they're not paying to the hydro utility company through the net metering program 
Um, so again, it's a lease type of option, uh, monthly charge and all maintenance and installation is covered. So a number of activities we're looking at, especially in the residential sector, I focused on today. Um, so if anyone has any questions regarding these programs, they can reach out to me. Um, there's my email, my cell phone contact number. I am the geothermal specialist here, so I oversee the program development for geo, but I'm a technology expert and working within a broader group uh, of our business development team that's working on a number of these projects. So I would be likely your best first contact, and then I can push you off to my team members that are working on technology specific uh, applications. And short and sweet, Stephanie, I hope that was enough time for some questions. Yeah, no, that was uh, perfect. So it looks like we've got about uh, 10 minutes or so before uh, the, the segment uh, ends. So thank you so much for that information, Jeff. Uh, so we had a, a few questions come in uh, in the question and answers. And also I saw some comments in the chat. So what we'll do is just take a few minutes to go um, through those. Uh, the first thing that I'll let everybody know, because I know it came up a few times. Um, yeah, so the recording for this, as well as the um, my slides. Now, Jeff, are you able to share your slides as well? I can, yeah. Perfect. Okay, so those will be sent out uh, in a, a resource email that I'll send out later this week, um, uh, along with a link to the recording. So you'll get that. Um, so don't worry about that. I saw that uh, a few times. Uh, now, somebody had asked about purchasing offsets. And so I, I had put an answer that uh, I'm not sure if everybody can see that. But um, uh, one place that that I've, I've learned about in my studies is uh, Carbon Zero. So CarbonZero.ca. So if you wanted to uh, purchase offsets, uh, or you could learn more information information on their website and I believe they uh, you can purchase ops, offsets from there. Now, Jeff, do you have any examples of geothermal at the community block level or point to any reports on lessons learned, learned uh, barriers and things like that? Uh, yes, there's been a number of studies done on community-based geosystems. We don't have any here um, active right now in Ontario, but there's been a number of them done in um, British Columbia. Uh, Alberta has one as well. And throughout the, the North American climate, there's a number of systems that are installed. There's a, uh, several case studies on community-based geosystems as well. Uh, I can see if I can dig that up and provide some links with my uh, with my slide presentations as well. But this is this application has been done a number of times. Um, it's just now becoming more popular as we're trying to focus on that carbon reduction. Uh, taking it to a community level is really the next step. So there's a number of projects in Ontario currently in construction that we're excited to see go in. There's one in, in Markham um, that's uh, quite large, 376 homes that Madame is doing, I believe. So yeah, there are some examples. I can provide some links uh, as best I can at the end of this. Okay, thank you, Jeff. Uh, now, Jason had asked, are the homes full lifespan considered in the overall emissions calculation? Since steel, for example, is a higher upfront cost, it must catch up uh, on the lifespan of the home as steel uh, should last longer. So um, I'm going to just say that when we do uh, these, these uh, emissions calculations, there is a look at kind of that, um, uh, that, that uh, that kind of cross point, I guess you could say, um, is looked at, but I'm going to leave that one for uh, Chris Magwood as well, because he can go into more detail on that, uh, since he was very in integral in, in uh, the building of that calculator. So if you're okay with that, um, that will get you coming back for the uh, other, <laughs> uh, other episodes. So if that's okay with you, I will leave the more detailed answers uh, for Chris on that. Um, okay, so let's move. So those are all the questions that were in the Q&A. Now let me just find uh, the chat. So you'll just have to bear with me uh, because it scrolls. I kind of lose some of the um, lose some of the uh, some of the questions here. So I'll try to find them all. Um, so here's a, a, a question: What is being done to reduce stick frame construction on site and move to industrialization type approach where? Components and practices are built uh, more along factory processing. And then um, Conrad goes on to say, in his opinion, individual stick frame construction is non-sustainable due to things like uh, material waste, lack of skilled workers, supply chain problems, quality issues, whether um, an industrialization of housing, which is a reality in many parts of the world, uh, helps to ensure houses are less expensive, high quality, and quicker to get into. And uh, so Conrad, I know I'm, I have actually been um, a big advocate for this as well. Um, having been a, a renovator, I've been a renovator for for uh, many years, but but then uh, also have worked uh, with new home builders. 
And um, I saw um, a, a quite a revolutionary um, manufactured housing facility in Edmonton called AccuBuilt. And um, it was incredibly impactful. Um, the, the efficiency in which they were able to build uh, at that time, anyways, this is about six or seven years ago, uh, three homes a day with inside their factory, uh, including all the way to, to siding. They, they did not include electrical or drywall. Um, but it, it became very clear to me that, you know, as we uh, continue to have a shortage of labor, um, this sort of methodology begins to make a lot of sense um, and uh, and and to all the benefits that you had mentioned about supply chain quality issues, weather and those sorts of things. So I would anticipate uh, that we will continue to see an increase where we are starting to see an increase in this uh, manufactured type of housing. Um, so I would anticipate um, there's going to even be an continued increase on, on that front. And so I'm in completely a complete agreement with you on that, Conrad. And uh, I know some other people, Bob uh, had had uh, agreed with Conrad on that as well. Uh, let's see. Did you have anything you wanted to chime in on that, uh, Jeff, at all, or Susan? I know it's a little bit different than uh, than your field of study, but it, um, if you have anything you want to add on that or what you're saying, uh, feel free to jump in. Uh, so I've been working with component prefab companies for the last 30 years, uh, and that's the way to go. So uh, he said that he was, uh, Bob said that he was finding that a lot of site personnel don't uh, don't necessarily want to work very hard. I guess you've had, run into some issues, Bob. Um, and um, and so you're finding that the prefab or manufacturing uh, works. Uh, so someone, Bob, had asked in all capital letters, what happened to Tesla on my slide? <laughs> so I didn't include Tesla because they've already been electric. Those were slides of companies that have gone from gasoline um, who are now moving to electric. But, uh, but you know, just for fun, maybe I will, uh, I'll, I'll tuck them in there somewhere. Um, another question was why not net zero uh, net zero versus net zero energy ready? Um, so again, that's a question uh, for for the codes. I know I actually I live in a net zero ready home, and I just had some solar put on back in September, and um, and it's not inexpensive, um, you know, so that is certainly uh, something to, to think about. I also know that just in dealing with different um, builders that sometimes there's certain constraints uh, on the electricity grid in feeding electricity back to the grid. Um, so uh, perhaps that is one of the reasons I don't know all the answers to that, but, um, but uh, certainly, um, uh, Andy from, from Building Knowledge has sat, sat on the code committee, so uh, he will be uh, participating in the third episode. And so that's certainly a, a good question that could come up um, during that third episode on uh, November the 18th. Uh, let's see here. So Leo, uh, you're interested in collaborations uh, as a First Nation. So, uh, so what I'll do, Leo, is, is I'll send a message to you um, after we get off of the uh, webinar. And um, yes, I'm able to share the presentation. Now there's someone that was asking something about air transport. Um, and I and has anyone done calculations on, on savings? Um, I don't have an answer to that, um, but I could certainly maybe ask my prof <laughs> who, who uh, is teaching the carbon accounting course that I'm in. So uh, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll send them an e email and see if I can get an answer for you, Roger. Um, now, Roya wanted to know if there were any insights uh, from the home buyer market on perceptions relating to decarbonization of our homes and the impacts that that will have. Um, you know, that's actually a great question, Roya, and one that um, that I think I would actually like to inquire with uh, Avid Ratings, uh, with Tim Bailey from Avid Ratings to see if he's found any. I know we had, he and I had talked about this in the past um, to see if they have found any sort of research on that. You know, my my personal experience just in dealing with different different people is um, everyone is so busy, you know, and in, in my renovation business too, you know, everybody's so busy, you know, just in their day to day lives that sometimes these things don't even come across their radar. Um, but uh, we have seen, you know, sort of an increase uh, in awareness on this issue. So I, I think more research needs to be done on that. Um, but, you know, I will see if I can find some information and, and send that out. Uh, perhaps even uh, Shelton Group has done some work on that. Uh, I think, 
Oh, uh, Jeff, here's a question for you. What will the impact of dumping heat into the ground or cooling the ground with large scale geothermal systems be? Could there be a negative long term consequence that are not uh, being considered today? Um, so do, do you have any answers on that, Jeff, that you could provide? Yes, yeah, Stephanie, that's a great question, um, actually. So yes, there's some significant engineering that needs to go into this to, to ensure that we're not negatively, negatively impacting the, the soil conditions. Um, if properly sized and spaced, um, we're going to depths of you know, 500, 600 feet. There's a significant amount of ground space out there. Um, and the, the soil temperature differences from season to season remain relatively constant uh, as status quo, but as we start rejecting heat or pulling heat from that ground, certainly proper engineering will be needed. Um, I don't think until you get, you know, if you were to do every single residential home in, in Ontario or across Canada, certainly there might be effects, but isolated uh, geothermal systems at a community level should be okay if properly designed and properly spaced apart. Um, the so sun shines almost every day, so it regenerates that heat. Um, and, and there's a significant amount of ground there to reject to. So um, engineering is key to all of these new technologies that we're looking at. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Jeff. So that takes us to uh, 12 o'clock. Now I'm going to just, okay, so I wanted to give everyone um, just a heads up about uh, what's upcoming. So, but before I do that, again, I want to thank uh, Jeff and Susan uh, and Enbridge for their sponsorship of this uh, webinar series, this four-part series, and uh, certainly looking forward to um, part two, which is coming up on November the 10th. So that's next week. And so, as I mentioned, so Chris is going to be talking about uh, material selection. So actually in, in looking at that carbon calculator uh, in the third, episode, which is November the 18th. He will then be uh, talking about uh, the report that I had, had shown you all and uh, some case studies in there and the findings. And, and then uh, the last episode will have uh, three builders who I will announce uh, later, but they've all confirmed. So I'm very excited about them. Uh, three leading uh, builders in this industry on November the 25th. And so what we're going to be doing is doing a panel discussion. So it'll be me and Chris, along with uh, the three builders going through uh, some various questions. So if you do happen to have any questions you would like to ask the builders, um, feel free to email me those. And uh, what I'll do is I'll, I'll try to get those um, uh, added to kind of our, our uh, portfolio questions that we'll be asking. But of course, you can also ask them uh, during, the, during the presentation on the 25th as well. So. Uh, that is all I have for today. Um, we do have in November and in December are the, the last of the 2021 uh, webinar series. Uh, so just kind of keep those uh, in, in your in your calendar. And uh, with the resource email that I'll send out with uh, the, the PDFs of the presentations and the recordings and that sort of thing, I'll, I'll give you links to, uh, to these as well. So you make sure that you're all registered. So um, that's it. I hope everyone has a fantastic day. Please feel free to answer the survey monkey so that we can uh, continue to improve uh, with our presentations. And I hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Susan. Thanks, Stephanie. Okay. Bye, everybody.